I've seen it done more elegantly than this. Uh, you could well face her up. Um, Stephen Davis has done it, uh, and he showed it at the last uh, rep show. So. Uh, it's just for yeah. 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 functional. Yeah, it's functional. Yeah. So there it is. Uh, the motor. How much dollars are we looking at for the motor control ballpark? Uh, twelve hundred dollars or so. Okay. Um, you, can, you can get them for less. The motor itself is about four hundred fifty dollars, oh. brand new. Um, the the uh, supplier sells sort of B stock motors for about two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. But you're taking your chances. Well, B stock motor is one that somebody's returned. Or yeah, or possibly they've lost packaging for it. Okay. Um, and packaging is really important. If it ships from Michigan, it it, it tends to self destruct inside the box. Because it bounces back. <laughs> yeah, because it's quite heavy. Right? It's yeah. Twenty three pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see there the coupler joining together. Um, and this particular outboard motor. Um, so your shim, the black shim, are they metal or are they just wood? Yeah, they're aluminum. Yeah, just just a piece of aluminum bar that kind of right. and, 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 and yeah, hand block. The corrosion in there. There's the hall sensors. Uh, this is just for my tell a story about the hall sensors. For the pain story. Uh, so here's the first test. This was actually with the original motor and the um, controller that the motor people sent me for free. They sent it. Uh, because it's, it's a four burnisher controller and it doesn't have speed control, it basically has it on and off. Um, but it worked this motor just fine, and it was good enough for a test. So um, I made a temporary deck on the uh, on the boat out of plywood and two by fours, um, just to get an idea of where the weight should be on the boat and where the motor should go, because it's basically uncharted territory. If you're, if you're putting a motor on the back of an out a, a, a plane boat or a boat that usually has an outboard, you know where it's supposed to go. But this this was a sailboat, so it didn't have a motor, so so I had to um, figure it out as we went along. This I found at a used place, a used marine place that was a console, so it had a steering mechanism and a shifter and stuff. So there it is, mounted mm -hmm. up. Um, and new paint on the hull, which cost more than the boat did. Like fiberglass paint or epoxy paint? And epoxy paint and also a strip, a strip of uh, Kevlar, um, a sort of wear resistant Kevlar strips down uh, on the, uh, oh, the heel. Heel yeah. of the boat, right. Because yeah. it was fairly well worn from coming up, up on the beach up there for mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, so just fairing it and, and um, strengthening it. And uh, I was able to borrow a Hobie trailer from somebody at Jericho, which was great because it's, uh, it's not an easy boat to transport, it's eight feet wide. Uh, so we winked it up onto the trailer to come along. It's about that, the weight of that is about 600 pounds. So there we are at Cape Park. Now that's a different trailer you use for the <coughs> That came with the uh, trailer. Um, he didn't want the trailer in the salt water. Yeah. So they take the boat off onto this little carriage and then you're able to the water. Uh, and we used, I used four car batteries to get 48 volts. Uh, I had to the batteries, yeah. Um, and that's the sort of one thing I would recommend. Um, if people don't buy the batteries until you're ready for the batteries, uh, because batteries age, and there's no point sitting having batteries sitting around for, in this case, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. I bought them mm -hmm. at the start of the project, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so buy mm -hmm. the batteries. Mm -hmm. So we tried uh, the batteries in the front uh, and also in the back, just to get an idea of how things work. Um, and uh, it, everything went fine. Um, the boat fits surprisingly low in the water. 
Uh, but it's not a problem with the, the, the hull or steel. And there's uh, with the batteries on the back. So that, that's 170 pounds worth of batteries. You just to kind of get an idea of where the weight should go. Yeah, it kind of looks like personal watercraft, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it almost is, um, mm -hmm. but one of the problems with the catamaran is it doesn't have a lot of weight carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I'd gone with an 18 footer instead of a 16 footer because it would have had more weight capacity. So, um, here it is back in the backyard. The grass is long dead. <laughs> uh, and so I'm putting in uh, these aluminum pieces which I got uh, at the used metal place um, as support for a plywood deck, proper deck. And that's the back of the boat. So that's the motor mount right there, flat on, and there's uh, braces to take the, uh, the torque from the motor. Yeah, on that symbol. Yeah, I, I was going to weld it, but then um, all the uh, aluminum is anodized, and you can't weld it without grinding, so it's just it's easy, much easier just to bolt it. So the other thing from a maintenance standpoint is probably easier to bolt it, because if yeah. you bolt it and you use a lock nut or you use a lock tight, it's not going to come undone. Exactly. You damage a stringer, you can take it apart. Exactly, yeah, so I use um, my lock nut. Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay, so here is the um, plywood deck. Uh, basically, just try to make it as light as possible. It's actually 3 8 plywood. So it's very thin, um, but it's marine grade. So it doesn't get wet. Right, yeah. Um, and then uh, the stringers, so these guys sit on top of the aluminum pieces, and then this is reinforcement. And it's basically just. Um, two layers of the plywood laminated with epoxy. And when when you step on that without those, the plywood was totally flexing. With with that in place, it's stiff, stiff, stiff. So um, it works out as well. So here's the deck in place and the batteries are uh, getting wired up. Uh, so basically that they're right as far forward on the deck as, as possible. And that seems like it's about the center of the ball. So that's um, 100 pounds of uh, GB lithium batteries, um, 48 volts, 100 amp hours. Did you ever consider putting the, the batteries on the actual pontoon to keep the weight lower at all? Yeah, there was some thought about <coughs> that, um, and there was advice to do to put the batteries in the hull, but. Um, I think with, with, from a moisture standpoint, like it's bound to get moist in there. Yeah. Um, even, you know, even given that they're sealed up, I can just imagine that there would be moist in there and it wouldn't be a good environment for the motor. Sure. And there's no way to get into those holes. They would have to be cut open. So the hole hatch put on. Uh, do the holes have holes in them? No. Because they're hollow holes. Yeah. So once you cut holes in them, you would destroy the integrity of the hole. Yeah, to some extent, right, there's some mechan mechanical integrity that you do. Yeah. You can see there's an inspection port there, yeah. and that's um, oh, just to make sure there's no water in it or yeah. whatever, not to let it dry out. Plus, plus the temperature. Right, so right. temperature variations yeah. um, can cause condensation, and, and just being able to access the battery easily. Um, and I'm not, wasn't so worried about it um, as far as the weight, because it's 8 feet wide and 16 feet long, it's very, very stable. Um, it originally carried a 25 foot high mass. Yeah. So, um, and obviously you can, you can tip those boats over if you ever, ever seem to be sailing them up on one haul. But um, without the mass there, it didn't seem to be uh, much of an issue. Uh, also, because it's a uh, commuter boat, um, I added lighting. Um, navigation light uh, and there's a rear light uh, for lots of lots of wiring. For how much? The batteries were uh, thirty-two hundred dollars. Um, I 
looked at doing lead acid batteries, uh, and to get this capacity, which which was sort of we figured it's necessary to do the trip, um, to be working at 450 pounds, which was just too much for the boat to handle. So it basically this is this is only doable with the lithium batteries. So your voltage from the batteries is what 32 volts. Uh, 48. 48 volts. Yeah. So same volts as four 12 volt lead acids. Right. But the 12 volt lead acids wouldn't give you the range. Right. Yeah. So, so this gives you what kind of range? Um, I'll, I'll go into it. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, it's, go it's a good range. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here you can see uh, there's like four 12 volt sections, and uh, they come strapped together. Um, there's like a metal strap. And so you, you basically uh, already have the electrical connection um, between the cells on each 12 volt section. And then this wire here is joining the two sections up. And here I'm putting the, the BMS module on for the battery management. Uh, it's being installed there. And again, this is a package from the electric auto port from Greg Murray and Ben Huber here. It includes the BMS, um, a monitor for the BMS, the batteries, all the hardware to strap the batteries together, um, and it's got a year warranty on it. So I think it's a good way to go. Instead of getting the batteries from one person and BMS from another, if it's a problem, it's going to be the battery guy saying the BMS is a problem, you know, and vice versa. So there is a close-up of the top of the cell that the BMS uh, installed. When you install it, there's a little light that shows up um, telling you that you've got a connection and there's a red LED over here for uh, LD when the balance is going on. And it had to be secured to the boat somehow, so uh, basically there's, there's just a, a little tray that I epoxy on and um, on the end of the battery there's a little lip so it goes underneath um, the end and then this bar in the middle keeps them from lifting in the middle and there's completely secure you could uh, put the boat upside down. So that's that four, that four rows of batteries stacked up then? Or is it, um, the batteries just no, up they're all? actually, you can see there's one cell there, okay. there's another cell, another cell and they're strapped together with stainless straps. Okay, so each battery is all in stainless. Yeah, and they're like 3.6 volts. So three of them together give you 12 volts. Four of them together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not only 12 volts, it's actually more than that. Yeah. So there is basically complete. Um, so I've built an extra extension to the bench. There's a charge port there and a little window that you can uh, see the light from the charger. Um, the, the console came with this shifter, which is compatible with the motor. Um, the shifter is not compatible with the electrical system. Um, basically, I had to do some uh, tricky wiring to get the shifter to, to operate the controller. Uh, but I wanted it to be uh, like this is an outboard, a gas outboard motor controller shifter. Um, so anybody who knows how to operate a typical outboard boat could, could operate it. It works in the same way. Um, you turn the ignition key, which is the original key, um, and you have to have it in neutral before you turn the key or the next car, all these, all these things. Um, and actually, uh, my first uh, thought was that I would just reverse the motor in order to reverse the direction. So if you want to back up, but um, you can't reverse this motor. It was just the gear shifting, um, and apparently that's typical of, of uh, outboard motors. So um, you actually do have to physically shift the motor into gear, and going forward or going backwards is putting the motor into forward in both cases. Apparently what they do is the gears that can be reversed. Yeah. They're not as strong or as well manufactured as the gears that handle forward. Right. They keep the motor lighter, they keep the cost down. 
And, uh, and I think it's something to do with um, when, it, when you are coasting, the, um, the motor, the propeller will turn, so it's skipping as if it was going in reverse. Yeah. So it's not acting as a brake when you uh, let the power off. So there's access to uh, all the electronics. When you let off the gas, it goes. Because when you let off the gas, it slows down. Right? Like oh yeah, for sure. It does, it does slow down, um, but it has much more drift than your typical plane hull because it doesn't have that that <coughs> suck back at the back of the hull. So you're yeah. talking about like a propeller sort of three wheels. But you can actually once you let off the power, and the boat's just drifting forward. And it's, uh, it's interesting if you're used to a regular boat that sort of, when you let the power off, it stops. Yeah. Well, this one doesn't. So if you're coming into a war, you got to be careful because it's keeps going. Right? Right. Right. And it wants to go straight, it doesn't want to turn. So, uh, well, unless you put it reverse in which case it will. Yes. Um, although, that's a good point. When, when we first did the test, um, it would not turn in reverse. So you could turn the motor yep. all the way and put it in reverse and it just go straight back. Yeah, because of the, because of the where you've got the motor is based on the pontoon. Right. Um, and so what I determined from that was that I needed a bigger keg on the bottom of the motor. Yep. So the yep. motor has a little fin on the bottom that protects the propeller. Um, and I enlarged that and that did the trick. Now it actually does turn in reverse. So it needed, it needed about twice as big as keg. Uh, so there's, um, that is the BMS computer, so that controls the BMS system. Um, strangely enough, uh, I don't know if Greg could explain it, but it, it's supposed to be powered up all the time. Well, um, yes, it's one of the capacities. I know a little bit about the BMS and the Yeah. Um, the new BMS um, program has put the amp hour capacity calculation into the non volatile memory versus into the main flash memory. And so you can now turn off the power to the VMS really, and it, when you power it back up, you'll, uh, the VMS will remember how much capacity you have in your battery. That's what that so, yeah, so no. So mine, uh, when you turn the VMS off and turn it back on again, uh, if you didn't have the charges plugged in when you turn it back on again, it'll give you a 50% charge level no matter what charge level you have. Okay. Um, they can improve the program. So yeah, so this is apparently updatable. It and is. we have only one update it the laptop. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, and it has <coughs> this, the VMS has um, an over voltage and under voltage warning output. Um, the over voltage warning goes to the charger, so it interlocks with the charger, shuts the charger off at a certain voltage. And that, oh, the charger is part of the package as well. So that $3,200 includes the charger. Um, and it's a 700 watt charger, something like that. So it's, it's not a trivial thing. Um, and the, uh, the under voltage, um, go to this relay and for some reason the, the convention on this is that it's always on and when there's a warning it turns it off. Yeah. So I had to put a relay in there to reverse that the so that it would turn the button on when the alarm went. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so there's the main output from the battery. Uh, uh, 250 amp fuse, and uh, this is a shunt uh, for the VMS uh, system. And this is the other side of the console. Um, so this is a 12 volt fuse block. Uh, so I've got a 240 watt PC converter to give you 12 volts. And uh, that's for all the lighting. And then a couple more fuse. I had one fuse block, I had to add another one. Um, surprise, I'll put the wire to here and there. And um, I want to make sure everything's fit. There's the charger. Uh, and it has lights on the end to give you an indication of the charge status. Um, so I put a mirror there and a little window so you can actually look through and see the light. Uh, and then the fan is actually to the outside. Is it a 12-volt computer fan? <coughs> uh, it's the internal fan in the charger. It just draws uh, fresh air from up 
decided so that things don't get too hot. So it's just a, a dryer mask pipe. And there is the charge port, and um, right there is a little switch. And that's something I added um, to the micro switch. Basically, when you're charging the system, <coughs> the EMF has to be on. So you, you have to remember to turn the ignition on, to turn the EMF on. Uh, but uh, what it is here is just that little switch when you open the charge port, it turns the EMF on uh, so that everything is cool without having to run out. And there's the light from the charger. This is the display that you get. Actually, the display is, I put it in a box because it's not an outdoor display. So. Um, and I found that this is not all that accurate. <laughs> um, so the original plan was to use a cycle analyst, um, which is a, another watt meter. Another watt meter that um, anybody who's familiar with e bikes um, knows. And I know that the cycle analyst is accurate, so I use that as well. So there's a the dashboard. Uh, so there's the cycle analyst and lighting and the shifter. This is um, an emergency shutoff, and you're supposed to actually wrap that around your wrist. There's a little cord to wrap around your wrist, so if you fall off the boat, it shuts off. Yeah. Uh, not likely that anybody's going to fall off the boat. So there's the finished motor, um, and basically, uh, I wanted to. Uh, Keep the controller next to the motor. So there's the controller. It, this barely fit in. Um, I would recommend if anybody's doing this, this is a 9.9 horse motor. It's the smallest motor. You should probably use like 15 horse uh, because there's barely enough room. Um, and also the prop will be bigger, that kind of thing. Yeah? Um, the emergency shutoff switch 